that many other countries are in the same plight that we were in. A considerable part of the world has followed us already. We may be able to make ourselves the centre of a new international currency system, including the whole of the empire and much of the rest of the world. But if we are to achieve this, we must free ourselves from the bondage of old ideas. John Maynard Keynes grew up against the background of the old ideas. His achievement was to change those ideas, but to preserve their setting. We've seen that it is intellectuals, not deprived and exploited workers, who make revolutions. That's why conservatives, quite rightly, view intellectuals with suspicion. Keynes was the author of what we now call the Keynesian Revolution, a comfortable origin here in the Cambridge academic world, then Eton, then back here at King's, then the civil service, then life as a young Cambridge Don. None of this sounds very much like the making of a revolutionary. The trouble is with the word revolution. His was a revolution designed not to change, but to conserve. Keynes believed that depressions and unemployment were destroying the world that he so much approved and he sought to end them. And he sought also to end the traditional remedies for depression and unemployment, wage cuts, price cuts, public belt tightening, because these did not work and were as painful as the disease they were aimed to cure. Keynes's revolution, in other words, was something very odd. It was a conservative revolution designed to save the existing system. And Keynes was, in fact, or shall we say, an activist conservative. This was not how Keynes was perceived in his time. His disciples, I was one, liked to think of themselves as radicals. To this day, some of his aging followers still cling to that lovely thought. Keynes was born in 1883. His mother was a diligent community leader, and his father, John Neville Keynes, an economist, was the chief administrative officer at Cambridge University. Keynes, here watching the May races, had a completely happy boyhood, and likewise later. Keynes never sought to change the world out of personal discontent. For him, it was excellent. When he was finished with Cambridge in 1905, Keynes sat for the civil service examinations, and he did badly in economics. The examiner, she said, presumably knew less than I did. But this handicap was not fatal, and he went to the India office, where he relieved his boredom by writing on Indian currency and the laws of probability. Soon he returned to Cambridge, still the Cambridge of Edwardian England. Here in training was the newest ruling class. Not workers, not capitalists, not the old landed aristocracy, but the mandarins, the intellectual elite that would occupy the real seats of power in Westminster. When the war came, Keynes was not attracted to the trenches. He went instead to the treasury. And he quickly learned how to die, drive, and succeed in the wartime bureaucracy. and he was one of the most eminent of the mandarins. He was, accordingly, a natural choice for the British delegation to the peace conference. And that, from the official view, was a bad mistake. Mandarins should be manageable, and Keynes was not. The armistice brought relief from debt, and very soon there was hope of relief from debt. Germany should be made to pay. The mood in Paris, vengeful, myopic, indifferent to economic reality, horrified Keynes. And so did the civil servants, and so especially did the politicians. In June, he resigned and came home. He proceeded to compose the greatest polemical document of modern times. It was against the Versailles Treaty and against the Carthaginian peace. The economic consequences of the peace was published before the end of 1919. A modern publisher would have taken another year and got it out for the Christmas market in 1920. This was the message of the book. Europe would only punish itself by exacting or trying to exact more from the Germans than they had the practical capacity to pay. Restraint by the victors was not a matter of compassion, it was a matter of elementary self-interest. Keynes also contributed his impressions of the men who were writing the piece. Of Woodrow Wilson, he said, this blind and deaf Don Quixote. Of Clemenceau, he had one illusion, France, and one disillusion, mankind. His observations on Lloyd George were more severe. How can I convey to the reader who does not know him any just impression of this extraordinary figure of our time, 
this siren, this goat-footed bard, this half-human visitor to our age from the hag-ridden magic and enchanted woods of Celtic antiquity. No man is of perfect courage. Keynes deleted this passage on Lloyd George at the last moment. The judgment of the British establishment was rendered by the Times. Mr. Keynes, it said, may be a clever economist. He may have been a useful Treasury official. But in writing this book, he has rendered the Allies a disservice for which their enemies will be doubtless grateful. Causing pain to the British establishment, not joy to the enemy, was, of course, Keynes's real crime. But this the Times did not say. Keynes had broken the code, and so he suffered the penalty. The next 20 years, he headed an insurance company, speculated in shares and commodities and foreign exchange, sometimes losing, but mostly winning. And he also speculated, fortunately with success, for King's College, of which he became the bursar. But henceforth on government matters, he was an outsider, not a man to be trusted. While he was at Cambridge, Keynes had been a member of a group of ardent young intellectuals. One of these was Lytton Strachey, the most brilliant of stylists, and another was Leonard Wolfe, writer, publisher, and Virginia Wolfe, and Vanessa Bell, the painter. They now recreated themselves in London as the famous Bloomsbury Group. All had been much under the influence of the philosopher G. E. Moore. Keynes once told what he had from Moore. It was the belief that the appropriate subject of passionate contemplation and communion were a beloved person, beauty and truth, and that one's prime objects in life were love, the creation and enjoyment of aesthetic experience, and the pursuit of knowledge. Of these, love came a long way first. With thoughts like these, one can readily understand Keynes becoming an economist. Perhaps more in keeping with Moore, Keynes also married Lydia Lopakova, who had just enchanted London as the star of the Agulhas Ballet. Was there ever such a union of beauty and brains as when the lovely Lopakova married John Maynard Keynes? Perhaps it was well that Keynes was in London. Someone in the Cambridge academic community is said to have asked, has Maynard really married a chorus girl? Keynes in these years told of his lifelong interest in the arts especially the performing arts. The artist walks where the breath of the spirit blows him. He cannot be told his direction, he doesn't know it himself. But he leads the rest of us in fresh pastures. I said that Keynes was kept outside. Experience in these years showed that it might have been safer to have kept him inside. Then there would have been some curb on his words. The man who had most reason to wish for such a restraining hand was Winston Churchill, then Chancellor of the Exchequer. It was Churchill's misfortune in these years to preside over the most dramatically disastrous economic action by a government in modern times. Keynes advertised his error to the world. The mistake was in returning the pound in 1925 to the gold standard at the old golden dollar value of $487 to the pound. Had Britain gone back to the pound at, say, $440, all would have been well. But with pounds bought at $487, British prices were about 10% over the world market. And 10% is 10%. Why would anyone, even Churchill, make such a mistake? The old rate for gold and dollars showed that British financial management was just as solid as in the 19th century. The war had changed nothing. And as an historian and professional custodian of the British past, this was a line of argument to which Churchill was fatally susceptible. And where money is concerned, style, manner, good tailoring, certainty of assertion, and personal assets are very often a substitute for thought. Churchill's speech in the Commons, announcing the return to gold, was a public triumph. Keynes, in a widely read article, asked why Churchill did such a silly thing. British prices could, of course, come down, but they could come down only if wages came down. 
and wages could come down in only one of two ways. There could be a horizontal slash, whatever the unions might say, or there could be unemployment. As it developed, there were both unemployment and the wage cut. As the war recovered after 1924, world coal prices fell. To meet this competition with the more expensive pound, the British coal owners proposed longer working hours, no minimum wage, and lower wages for all. The Royal Commission agreed on the lower wage. The miners refused and the owners locked them out. On the 3rd of May, 1926, the transport, printing, iron and steel, electricity and gas workers, and most of the building trades, came out in support of the miners. This, with some exaggeration, was called the general strike. For a fair number of workers, it didn't make much difference. Unemployment, the other remedy, was also being applied. In these years, it ranged from 7 to 9 percent of the labor force. With the strike, those who had urged the return to gold now deployed the threat to constitutional government. Churchill took a very strong stand for law and order. The general strike was soon over. It lasted only nine days. For the miners, things were much more grim. They remained on strike through most of 1926, and eventually they were defeated. Keynes was redeemed as a prophet, but not as a statesman. Where men of great importance are wrong, it's very poor personal tactics to be right. The return to gold was meant to proclaim the strength and integrity of sterling. Instead, it demonstrated its weakness and the strength instead of the dollar. The, the late A.J. Liebling of the New Yorker magazine once formulated what he called Liebling's Law. It holds roughly that if a man of adequately complex mind proceeds in a sufficiently perverse way, he can succeed in kicking himself and his own ass out the door into the street. The return to the gold standard in 1925 was a very good manifestation by the financial experts of Liebling's Law. By 1927, the gold flow to the United States was alarming. Accordingly, in that year, Montague Norman, the head of the Bank of England, and Helmar Horace Greeley Schacht of the Reich Bank sailed for New York to try and get it back. Charles West of the Bank of France, he came too. They asked the Federal Reserve to lower its interest rate, expand its loans, and therefore ease monetary policy. The lower interest rate would discourage the flow of money to the United States, the easier money would mean higher prices and so less competition from the U.S. The Americans obliged. This was the action we saw last time that historians believe to have triggered the great stock market speculation of 1927-1929. It gets more credit than it deserves. But it was a mistake. Great events can have a precise point of origin. World War I at Sarajevo. The Great Depression began here at the New York Stock Exchange. In the 1920s, things were bad in Britain, but good in the United States, good at least for business corporations and the affluent. Profits increased, and the stock market boomed. And as in the later boom of the 1960s, there was a rush to get a piece of the new and wonderful technology. RCA radio was a great favorite. So was Seaboard Airline, a foothold in aviation. It was, in fact, a railroad. But the wonder of the age was the investment trusts. These were companies that invested in other companies that then invested in yet other investment companies. The profits and capital gains of many companies then cascaded back to the ultimate organizers. And so did the losses when they came. The investment trusts were the forerunners of the unit trusts or the mutual funds. In finance, many of the greatest inventions are in terminology, a new name for an old idea. If there was a symbol for this speculation, it came in two words, Goldman Sachs. There had been nothing like it since the South Sea bubble, and there would be nothing like it again until investors oversee services and Bernie Coinfeld. The show opened on December 4th, 1928. First on December 4th, 1928, the Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation was formed with a hundred million issue of stock, 90% of which was sold to a very eager public. Its function was to buy other stock to the extent of its capital, the closed end investment cost. February 1929 came a merger with Financial and Industrial Securities Corporation, another investment trust. Assets were now 235 million. Next, the trading corporation went into the market and bought its own stock. This had a good effect on its value. Then in July, it launched the Shenandoah Corporation. 
This was a $102,500,000 enterprise. Preferred and common stock was sold to the public, and the public share of the issue was oversubscribed sevenfold, so more stock was issued. In August, Shenandoah launched Blue Ridge for $142 million. A few days later, back at the Trading Corporation, 71,400,000 more in securities were issued. In October, when the stock market collapsed, so did all of this. Shenandoah, once $36, went eventually to 50 cents. The trading corporation had reached $222, and in a couple of years, it was below $3. Goldman Sachs now became conservative, rang down the fire curtain, and survived. October 24, 1929, was the end. A terrible day. Everyone tried to sell. Almost no one wanted to buy. The ticket fell hours behind the market, and across the country, people didn't know how bad things were. They only knew that they had been ruined. At noon, the authorities closed the visitor's gallery of the exchange. It was all too obscene. Day after day thereafter, the market went down and down and down. And with occasional rallies, it kept on going down for nearly three years. After the Great Crash came the Great Depression. Everything that had been weak before became weaker, collapsed. Banks, corporations, investment, consumer spending. And fear took over. By 1933, nearly a fourth of all American workers were without jobs. The government reacted to the depression as it had in earlier times. Things were not bad and certainly getting better. President Hoover took his stand for the traditional values and no one ever put them better. Now my conception of America is a land where men and women may walk in order to liberty, where they may enjoy the advantages of wealth, not concentrated in the hands of a few, but diffused through opportunity to all, where they may build and safeguard their homes, give to their children the full opportunities of American life, where every man shall be respected in the faith that his conscience and his heart direct him to follow, and where every where people secure in their liberty shall have leisure and impulse to seek the fuller life. He was not alone in the traditional faith. In Germany, Heinrich Rooney, the last of the Weimar chancellors, Hindenburg was the president, took the same stand. But in a more activist fashion, Rooney cut wages, salaries, prices, raised taxes. Around a quarter of all German industrial workers were then out of jobs. It stirred a terrible thought. If this were democracy, could Hitler be worse? Might he not lighten this darkness? British policy was also negative, but more discreetly so than Brunings or even Hoover's. Ramsay MacDonald, a stalwart opponent of the Great War, was now Prime Minister. The question you have to settle, and I have to try to settle, is whether the pound sterling is going to fluctuate so much from day to day that not one of you housewives, not one of you women who are responsible for the expenditure of your household income, will know from week to week how much the pound is going to bring to you. The government desires to stabilize. The nation is in trouble. The nation is in difficulties. Not women in trouble and not women in difficulties. Temporarily, clearly temporarily. The gold standard was abandoned. Free trade was abandoned. However, considerable unemployment remained. That was not purely temporary. Russia was untouched by depression, and no depression would have been much noticed there. The time had come for the agricultural collectivization that Lenin had postponed, and this stage in the revolution was infinitely more bloody than the first. Even Stalin was pained, and when Stalin was pained by other people's pain, it was pain indeed. Keynes was wholly clear as to the proper action. He wanted borrowing by the government and then the expenditure of the resulting funds. The British government paid little attention. Although Keynes now had a convert in Lloyd George. Roosevelt was following Keynes's policy, but out of necessity rather than conviction. And so a depressing thought was Adolf Hitler. Keynes was not known in Germany, and certainly not to the Nazis, but their instinct for action served them better than the sound economics of the time served Britain and the United States. In 1933, Hitler borrowed and spent, and at first mostly for civilian works, railroads, canals, public buildings, the Audubon. By 1936, unemployment was virtually
virtually at an end in Germany. The ceiling was then put over prices and wages, and this too worked. Germany had full employment without inflation. The people were not persuaded by the German example. People heard the screaming oratory and rejected the economics. But Roosevelt in the United States came saw his chance. A famous letter to Roosevelt summarized his case. I lay overwhelming emphasis on the increase of national purchasing power resulting from government expenditure, which is financed by loans. In 1934, Keynes went a step further. He carried his case directly to Roosevelt at the White House. This meeting was not a success. The president thought Keynes some kind of a mathematician rather than a political economist. And Keynes said that he had supposed the president was more literate, economically speaking. New Deal was doing much, making jobs, helping farmers, rescuing the banks and corporations, reviving hope. The National Recovery Administration, the NRA, was trying to arrest the downward spiral in prices and wages, the depression counterpart of the modern inflationary spiral. Then as now, most economists were deeply critical of the direct interference with market forces that NRA involved. The New Deal activity was being financed by borrowing, as Keynes urged. But it was borrowing reluctantly, convinced that it was violating the most basic canon of sound economic policy, the balanced budget. Keynes saw the need to deal more deeply with belief, and he set out to seduce the world with a book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. It was published in February 1936. More than a year earlier, Keynes had told Judge Bernard Shaw that it would largely revolutionize the way the world thinks about economic problems. And so it did. It's a lesson. Truth should never be sacrificed to modesty. Like the Bible and Das Kapital, the general theory is often deeply obscure. And as with Marx and the Bible, this helped greatly to win converts. I'm not reaching here for paradox. If you must struggle, really struggle, to understand the book, as with the Bible, Marx, and Keynes, you feel a commitment to the conclusions. After so much pain, the light. And as again with the Bible and Marx, there were enough contradictions, enough ambiguities, so that the discriminating reader could very often find just what he wanted to believe. Ambiguity, too one's disciples. The basic conclusion, however, was simple and unambiguous. Previously, it had been held that the economic system found its equilibrium at full employment. Idle men and idle plant were an aberration, a temporary failing. Keynes held that the modern economy could as well find its equilibrium with unemployment. The underemployment equilibrium results from businessmen and individuals seeking to save more than they invest or spend. Unemployment results when business firms do not invest and employ workers, save without spending instead. Now comes the remedy. Have the government borrow and buy from business firms, in effect with newly created money. Have it borrow and employ workers and give them welfare and unemployment benefits. Then go back to work. The underemployment equilibrium is broken. The book accomplished what advocacy of the practical program had not. One belief recruited disciples, and it changed government policy. I read the general theory in the summer of 1936, and to this day, I remember the shock. All I had been taught to believe, and was teaching others to believe, was at risk. There could be a shortage of purchasing power. Unemployment was not an aberration. In the absence of corrective action, it might be normal. To balance the budget might not be an act of wisdom. I faced up to the terrible possibility that I might have to change my mind. And for an economist, there is nothing worse. We are fighting, fighting to save a great and precious form of government. This was now 1936. The war was still against the Depression. And so I accept the commission you have tendered me. I join with you. I am Keynes' ideas were soon to be on their way to Washington, but by a rather circuitous route.
campaigns captured the United States by way of the universities, and principally by way of Harvard. In my case, at least, a bad conscience was a considerable factor. I was living as a tutor here at Winthrop House, and being a non-pretentious house, Winthrop House was not anti-Irish, as were some of the more dignified places of residence. So among our inhabitants were the Kennedy brothers. And meeting them here and becoming friends, I must say, had a considerable effect on my later life. It was a lovely and tranquil world, and the only problem was that things were so terrible just outside of the university walls. The effect of the Depression was wonderfully uneven. You had a fixed income, good investments, or a Harvard paycheck. You got richer as prices went down. A new car cost you only a few hundred dollars. You couldn't even afford to ride the streetcars. One of the most imaginative of the New Deal efforts, very radical in those days, was the Farmers Home Administration, a rescue and relief mission to the rural poor. It took pictures of its clients. In the United States, the social memory for the next 40 years would be of the Great Depression. escape from depression meant some kind of economic revolution. We talked of this at Winthrop House. But Keynes was a solution without a revolution. Our present world would remain, the unemployment and the suffering would go. It, I must say, it seemed a miracle. In 1936, after the publication of The General Theory, we met several times a week to discuss this wonderful thing. It was the young who were influenced. Economists, among other things, are economical of their ideas. They tend to make those that they acquired as graduate students are put into their first book, Do For a Lifetime. The great men of that time read and reviewed Keynes and found him wrong. They then carried their belief in balanced budgets and the gold standard to the grave and possibly even beyond. Change in economics is something that comes with the changing generations. <laughs> Howard Keynes went to Washington, in those days by train. It could have been this train. <laughs> On Thursdays and Friday nights, the Federal Express would be half filled with Harvard faculty members, old and young, all on the way to impart wisdom to the New Deal. And Howard Crimson once said the lectures of a noted professor of government were what he gave while catching the train to Washington. Increasingly, as the decade passed, the wisdom that we sought to impart was that of John Maynard Keynes. The Washington atmosphere initially was rather frigid. To spend public money to create jobs seemed profligate. To urge a budget deficit as a good thing seemed to many people insane. The men of sound judgment were appalled, and even your friends were cautious in the presence of such heresy. Where did one look for allies, support for the Keynesian heresy in Washington in the Depression years? It was above all to the Federal Reserve System a central bank of all places, symbol of the stoutest conservatism. Its boardroom, even today, is not considered a gathering place for dangerous radicals. Things, however, were somewhat different at that time. The head of the central bank, the head of the Federal Reserve in those days, was Mariner Eccles. He was a Utah banker of highly original mind. Eccles had seen the lines of depositors form outside his own banks to get their money, and he'd seen the bankrupt farmers outside the town and ideas very similar to those of Keynes had passed through his mind. His principal assistant was Lachlan Curry. Curry was a former Harvard faculty member who had published a book that anticipated some of the very important ideas of Keynes. Accordingly, he was thought very unsound, and he was not promoted. There's a lesson here, I may say. In economics, one should never be right too soon. You should wait until the parade is passing your door, and then you should step bravely out in front. From the Federal Reserve, the Keynesian heresy was circulated to the other government departments. It helped that Curry had now gone to the White House and could send the converted around to the key places. Maybe not to all of the Federal Triangle, but certainly here to the Treasury and to the Labor Department. 
This was no conspiracy, it was the spread of wisdom. Gradually the ideas became established, but the practice still lagged behind. Throughout the 1930s, government intervention to lift the level of employment remained half-hearted. In 1939, the last year of peace in Europe, nine and a half million Americans were still unemployed, 17% of the labor force. The war then brought the Keynesian remedy with a rush. Expenditures doubled and redoubled, and so did the federal deficit. And by 1942, unemployment was gone, labor was becoming scarce. There's another way of looking at this history. It could be said that Hitler, having ended unemployment in Germany, had gone on to end it in the rest of the industrial world. In any case, one now saw one of the enduring features of the Keynesian revolution, the difference between spending for welfare and spending for war. In the Depression years, modest spending for the unemployed had caused the gravest alarm. Now expenditures many, many times greater for weapons and soldiers were perfectly safe. The war, falling unemployment, brought a new threat. Rising prices, rising wages, inflation. For this, too, Keynes had a remedy. Put everything into reverse. Raise taxes to keep pace with wartime spending. Try by all possible means now to keep down the budget deficit. Keep the cost of living stable, if necessary, by subsidies, and then ask labor to forego wage increases for the duration. Confined price control and rationing, two essentials, those things in especially short supply. I circulated a paper with a similar set of proposals here in Washington. I've been summoned, summoned to town by Curry. It was for me an act of economic plagiarism of considerable importance, because in the spring of 1941, I was put in charge of price control, one of the most powerful economic positions of the wartime years. I have to tell you that I was overjoyed. I got the news here in the Brain Mansion, which was the first headquarters for wartime price control. I started here with around 15 staff members. Soon we outgrew these quarters and had to move, and during the war we had to move three times in all. We ended up in this size of a acreage. By then, for prices, rent, rationing, we had Washington and country some 17,000 employees. I was never clear who hired them all. It was from this desk that prices were fixed in World War II. Ultimately, with minor exceptions, all of the prices in the United States. There could be appeal to higher authority, but the appeals were not taken in very many cases because higher authority backed us up. I said many times that if anyone left the office with a smile, we felt that we hadn't done our job. To be effective, price control had to be painful. Those appealing for price increases came to this table. Those with the worst case always made the most eloquent plea. Knowing that their case was fraudulent, they had, uh, I suppose, rehearsed it the most times. We usually had figures on their earnings, and I would look down the table while someone was pleading the case for higher prices, and notice that staff members would be moving their fingers like this on the edge of the table. The reference was to a fable, the year of the great famine in the land of the ants. One day a patrol from an ant colony on the side of a steep hill found food, a lovely piece of horse manure. It was directly up the slope from the colony, and all the ants were mustered out to bring the food. They rolled it down the hill, and presently it was rolling faster and faster, and threatening to roll right by the ant colony and be lost. The queen ant went up and down the lines, encouraging her troops, who were holding against the food, encouraging them to ever greater exertions. Her antennae were going up and down like this, and thus our signal. It is ant language, and it means stop that horse shit. It was while I was directing price control that I first met Keynes. I'd gone to Cambridge to study under him in 1937, 1938, but that was the year of his first heart attack. He came into the outer office one day, unannounced, to deliver a paper. My secretary brought it in, said he seemed to feel he should see me. The name, she said, was Keynes. I looked at the paper. There it was, J.M. Keynes. The paper was a lucid condemnation of the prices that we were setting on corn and hogs. He called them maize and pigs. And to this day, I remember my feeling. It was as though St. Peter had dropped in on some parish priest. It was also in these offices, alas, that we discovered the shortcomings of Keynes, when and how his ideas did not work. Long before all workers had jobs, firms could raise prices, and they did. And wages could and did rise. This led in turn to the price wage or the wage price spiral. 
also learned that taxes could not be made to keep pace with wartime spending, and that the excess of purchasing power could not, as Keynes had proposed, be mopped up. One firm's prices were another firm's costs, and you could not hold one man's prices if his costs went up. So some general action was imperative. Previously, I had, I had argued against a general ceiling on prices with great conviction. Now I found myself arguing for it with almost equal passion, maybe more passion. I also noticed that almost no one else observed how completely I had changed my mind. The new policy worked, and I concluded that in economics, it's far, far wiser to be right than it is to be consistent. The great lesson of the war was here. The Keynesian remedy was asymmetrical. It would work against unemployment and depression. It did not work in reverse against inflation. And this is a lesson that now, more than 30 years later, the disciples of Keynes are still reluctant to accept. But now Keynes, who was once a heretic, is now the prophet of the established faith. And the faithful are still waiting for his remedies against inflation to work. Keynes himself did not stay to reflect on this failure. At Paris, he had fought the Carthaginian peace. In 1925, he had fought Churchill and the tyranny of gold. Now in 1944, delegates from 44 countries assembled here in New Hampshire. The purpose was to say that the errors on gold and on reparations on which Keynes had made his reputation were not repeated. The Bretton Woods Conference was not a conference between nations. It was really a conference of nations with Keynes. The result was the Bank for International Reconstruction and Development and the International Monetary Fund. The first would guide the minds of the victorious powers to reconstruction, not punishment, and the second would give a modicum of flexibility to the rule of gold. A country in trouble would not need to reduce prices and wages as in Britain in 1925, or devalue. Instead, it could win time by borrowing from the monetary fund. Thank you for calling Bretton Woods. May I help you? During these conferences, Keynes had another heart attack. There's no answer there. Many observed how he was protected and sustained in these days by Lydia Lopakova. Over shortwave radio to Britain, he told of the accomplishment. The emphasis was still on employment. There has never been, there's never been such a far-reaching proposal on so great a scale to provide employment to the present and increase productivity in the future. We've been working quietly, away in the cool woods and mountains of New Hampshire. And I doubt, I doubt if the world yet understands how big a thing we are bringing to Britain. Well, such were the hopes. After the war ended, Keynes went back to Washington to negotiate a loan, three and three quarters billions dollars, which was to see Britain through the post-war years or until exports would again pave the way. The loan was another aberration of the orthodox financial mind, this time of the great men of Washington and New York. They made it a prime condition of the loan that sterling would become convertible on timetable in 1947, convertible into dollars and gold. This was done and all of those who had obtained wartime hordes of sterling, speculators, black market currency operators, and also the banks, rushed joyfully to convert. The loan was used up in a matter of days. In 1925, sterling had been made convertible by Churchill with disastrous <coughs> results. 22 years later, almost exactly the same error was repeated with infinite precision, and this time Keynes was a reluctant participant. Keynes had always believed that men of self-confessed financial wisdom were wonderfully consistent, especially in their mistakes. He didn't love to see this further proof. On April 21st, 1946, he had suffered another heart attack and died. There was now a step forward of which Keynes would have strongly approved. This was the Marshall Plan. It centered here in Hotel Talleyrand on the Place Concorde. The Marshall Plan worked wonders in renewing prosperity in Europe. For the next 20 years in Europe, and the United States, employment was good, production everywhere increasing. The losses of the British loan were retrieved, and instead of paying, this time, the Germans received. Thus had the world been educated by Keynes. Even inflation was not serious. These were the good years, the age of Keynes. disappointments. We thought that the same miracle could be worked throughout the world, especially in the poor countries. 
We learned that capital could be supplied. Industrial experience, discipline skills, administrative experience could not. And in the absence of these, failure was more common than success. What worked in the rich countries did not work in the poor. Other problems emerged and converged. There was a terrible dependence of the Keynesian system in these years on spending for arms. There was the power of the great corporations. There was the unevenness of economic blessings in a world of too many automobiles and too few houses, too many cigarettes and too little health care. And there were the special problems of the great cities. And so the confident years, the age of Keynes, came to an end. Partly it was ended by the problems that it didn't solve, and partly it was ended by the problems that it created itself and didn't solve. <laughs>